Uh, my name is Helen Gardner. I'm a barrister specialising in employment law. I practice out of St Philip's Chambers. Um, we're we're cross country Leeds, Birmingham, and London. Um, I've been doing that job now for a bit over seven years. This is the last in my series of webinars about unfair dismissal. We've had an overview session and more detailed discussions on each of capability and conduct dismissals. Today I'm going to talk to you about redundancy. We'll start by looking at what constitutes a redundancy situation before moving on to talk about redundancy in the context of unfair dismissals. We'll consider fair procedure and that's going to include a discussion about consultation obligations. We'll also be touching upon determining the selection pool and the concept of bumping. Before consulting with employees or dismissing for redundancy, the employer must be satisfied that the statutory definition of redundancy has been applied. The definition can be found in section 139 of the Employment Rights Act 1996. It's not very easy to paraphrase, so I've set it out in full on the slide, so if you want to have a quick read of what's there. The hand of the state of affairs which you've set out in the uh, slide is a, a redundancy situation. Now, an employer may decide to make redundancies for a variety of reasons, for example, recession or um, something making business closure or reduction in staff numbers necessary, or, for example, the relocation of a business. To clarify, the law doesn't interfere with an employer's freedom to make those business decisions. And when it comes to a tribunal hearing, the employer will not be required to justify its decision for making redundancies. So provided that a tribunal is satisfied that redundancy is the genuine reason for a dismissal, it won't look behind the facts to see how the redundancy situation arose. If an employer is considering making dismissals, it's really important to consider whether the statutory definition applies, because employees dismissed for redundancy may be entitled to a redundancy payment, and redundancy is a potentially fair reason for dismissal, and so may give an employer a defence to an unfair dismissal claim. It will also call into play the issue of consultation of employees, and we'll come on to that shortly. Redundancy situations usually fall into three categories, um, business closure, workplace closure, so that is um, the closure of one of several sites or relocation to a new site, or diminished requirements of the business for employees to do work of a particular kind. Just a quick note on mobility clauses where there's a workplace closure. In cases where the employee's place of work is arguably two or more places, only one of which is closing, uh, it may be easier in practice to establish a redundancy situation by reference to a diminishing requirement for employees. That can avoid disputes about whether the mobility clause should be invoked. Of course, it may be that where there is a mobility clause in the contract and there's work available at another location, an employer chooses to invoke the clause instead of dismissing the employee as redundant anyway. Um, if there's no mobility clause, though, and contrary to the contract and the employee's wishes, the employer then insists that an employee re relocates, that may put the employer in fundamental breach of contract and give the employee the right to resign and treat themselves as constructively dismissed. So beware that. Work of a p particular kind, um, that's defined in section uh, 139. It doesn't mean work for which a particular employee was employed. The focus needs to be on the requirements of the business for the employees to do work of a particular kind rather than it's changing contractual requirements in, in relation to a particular employee or particular employees. Um, some common causes of dispute um, that arise. Um, while an employer needs to understand the statutory definition of redundancy, also needs to recognise the situations in which um, whether or not someone is technically redundant may come into dispute. An employee may still be in employment or have been dismissed when such a dispute arises. Uh, the employee may argue that he's redundant and entitled to a redundancy payment, or having received a redundancy payment, argue that he wasn't really redundant and has been unfairly dismissed. So it's important to bear in mind that what may start off as a proposed change to terms and conditions or a reorganisation may end up being a dispute about redundancy in the end. If redundancy isn't in dispute, that will give rise in most circumstances to a redundancy payment. However, where there's no genuine redundancy situation or where there's been an unfair process, there may be a claim for unfair dismissal, which if successful will open the employer up to increased financial liability. An employee has the right not to be unfairly dismissed by their employer. Um, generally, the right only applies after a qualifying period of service, and since 6 of April 2012, that's been two years. However, dismissal or selection for redundancy on certain prescribed grounds is deemed automatically unfair, and employees don't need a qualifying period of employment. Those include redundancy 
sorry, redundancy selection connected to pregnancy or childbirth, whistleblowing or asserting a statutory right. For a dismissal to be fair, the employer has to do has to have two things. Um, a potentially fair reason for dismissing the employee. There are five potentially fair reasons, and redundancy is one of them. The employer also must have acted reasonably in treating that reason as sufficient to justify dismissing the employee. So when we're considering the test of reasonableness, the, the tribunal must consider whether the decision to dismiss an employee was within the range of conduct that a reasonable employer could have adopted, having regard to Section 98.4 of the Employment Rights Act 1996. I haven't quoted that, but um, it's easy to find if you want to stick it into Google. And um, the principles of fairness are established by case law. So that collectively is known as the Band of Reasonable Responses Test. It's been confirmed many times uh, that the employment tribunal shouldn't impose its own standards and decide whether, if they'd been the employer, they would have acted differently. Instead, they have to ask whether the decision fell within the band of reasonable responses. The leading case on reasonableness in relation to redundancy is Polkey and AE Date and Services Limited, which you may well have come across in relation to arguments on the amount of compensation in other cases. Um, the House of Lords in that case held that an employer will normally not act reasonably and so a dismissal will be unfair unless it warns and consults employees or their representatives about the proposed redundancy. It adopts a fair basis on which to select for redundancy, so identify an appropriate pool from which to select the potentially redundant employees and select the proper criteria. And it searches for, and if it's available, offers other suitable employment within the organisation. I'm just looking at my slide, and that, ah, here we go. I'm a bit more technologically advanced than I'd anticipated, so <laughs> there you go. You can see what, um, the factors I've just read out. Um, in the case of Polkey, the employer needed to reduce overheads, and so reduce the number of its van drivers, one of whom was Mr. Polkey. Without prior warning or any consultation, either with affected employees or their representatives, a manager advised employees that they were redundant and handed them redundancy letters. A tribunal with which the Employment Appeal Tribunal and the Court of Appeal agreed held that they had not been unfairly dismissed, as even if the employer had consulted them, they would have been made redundant. The House of Lords disagreed with that, stated um, that in the case of redundancy, the employer will normally not act reasonably unless he wants and consults any employees affected or their representative adopts a fair basis on which to select for redundancy and takes such steps as may be reasonable to avoid or minimise redundancy by redeployment within his own organisation. So that's where those pointers come from. A further leading case on procedural fairness in redundancy predates Polkey. That's Williams and others versus Compare Maxim Limited. Now, the difference there is that that concerned a case in which there was a recognised trade union. The employer informed the union of impending redundancies, sought volunteers for redundancy, but then proceeded to select employees for compulsory redundancy without reference to the union and without any form of individual consultation. And the Employment Appeal Tribunal held that it would be impossible to lay down detailed procedures which all reasonable employers would follow in all circumstances because fairness must depend on the circumstances of each case. However, if employees are recognised, uh, sorry, are rep represented by a recognised union, then a reasonable employer will usually seek to act in accordance with a number of principles set down in that case, uh, and depart from them only with good reason. So the first we've got there is early warning. Uh, so the employer will seek to give as much warning as possible of impending redundancies, so we can enable the union and the employees who may be affected to take early steps to inform themselves of the relevant facts consider possible alternative solutions, and if necessary, find alternative employment in the undertaking or elsewhere. The next one is consultation with the union. Uh, the employer will consult the union as to the best means by which the desired management result can be achieved fairly and with as little hardship to the employees as possible. So the focus throughout all this is always on the uh, employee and giving them fair warning, fair consultation, time to absorb what's happening. Uh, they went on to say that, in particular, the employer will seek to agree with the union the criteria to be applied. Uh, and when a selection has been made, the employer will consider with the union whether the selection has been made in accordance with these criteria. Um, fair selection criteria are expected to be run past the union and agreed with them. And then, of course, fair selection in accordance with the criteria. So um, that's, again, uh, done 
considering any representations the union may make as to selection. Finally, uh, in Williams, they reiterated this consideration of alternative employment. So the employer will seek to see whether instead of dismissing an employee, he could offer him alternative employment. Uh, appeals. Um, now, it's not clear whether an employer has to offer a redundancy, uh, a, a, an employee dismissed on grounds of redundancy, a right of appeal against that dismissal. In Robinson and Ulster Carpet Mills, the Court of Appeal in Northern Ireland held that it wouldn't normally render a dismissal unfair to refuse appeal. However, uh, and I say this all with a, a word of caution, subsequent cases have stated that the absence of appeal is one of the many factors to be considered in determining fairness. Therefore, it's not necessarily fatal, but it may affect fairness depending on the facts. Um, from my point of view, generally speaking, it will be good practice to offer an appeal as that can enable disputes to be resolved internally without recourse to employment tribunals. Uh, and of course, if an employer does offer the right of appeal, it prevents its absence later being raised as an issue which goes to fairness. So if in doubt, give them the appeal hearing. Consultation is a really important factor when it comes to redundancy. Consultation with individual employees is fundamental to the fairness of any dismissal, and you are extremely, unlikely, uh, extremely likely to fail in any attempt to persuade the tribunal that redundancy was fair despite the lack of consultation. I've already mentioned Polkey, and um, there the argument that the consultation would make no difference was no defence. Size and administrative resources of the employer are relevant, but generally speaking, a small employer won't be excused from consultation. The size of the organisation goes to the nature and the degree of formality of any consultation, rather than the fact of it at all. In order for an employer to consult properly, it must have an open mind and still be capable of influence about the matters which form the subject matter of the consultation. That means that consultation will only be meaningful if it happens when it's at a formative stage rather than where there's been a fait accompli. The key components of fair consultation were in, identified in the case of R versus British Coal Corporation, and they are stated as consultation when the proposals are still at a formative stage, adequate information on which to respond, adequate time in which to respond, and conscientious consideration of the response to the consultation. Where there is a proposal to dismiss as a redundant 20 or more employees at one establishment within a 90-day period, sorry to bamboozle you with all these numbers, <laughs> the employer will have to engage in collective consultation with a trade union or, if no union is recognised, elected employee representatives. The requirements of collective consultation are set out in statute, that's section 188 of the Trade Union and Labour Relations Consultation Act. And if you look at that section, there are a number of prescribed matters which must be covered in a collective consultation. We don't have time to go into that today. It's probably a topic all on its own, which is only relevant to a few of you, so I won't bore you with it. Um, but do be aware of it if you fall into this uh, requirement for collective consultation. Individual consultation, on the other hand, is all about fairness based on the guidelines which can be derived from case law. Collective consultation doesn't eliminate the need to consult with individual employees, but it may, depending on the circumstances, make the employer's obligations in this regard less onerous. Since an employer is obliged to act reasonably in all the circumstances, the effect to which it's required to consult both collectively and at individual level will obviously depend on the facts. Unions, as we saw from the Williams case, will generally want to be involved in discussion of the selection criteria, but not their application to individuals for the purposes of selection. Consultation with individual employees will usually start once they've been at least provisionally selected to explain their own personal situation and to give them an opportunity to comment on their assessments. Looking then at the subject matter of consultation, the matters that should be discussed during the individual consultation process. Again, they depend on the specific circumstances, but usually they need to cover um, the matters which I've set out in the bullet points. So provide an opportunity for the employee to comment on the basis for selection, both in terms of the pool and the selection criteria. Uh, provide an opportunity for the employee to challenge their redundancy selection um, 
and to explain any factors which might have led to their selection and of which their employer uh, might not have been aware. There's also uh, an opportunity for the employee to put forward any suggestions they've got for ways to avoid either their redundancy or indeed the redundancy situation as a whole. Uh, consideration of alternative employment positions that might exist and an opportunity for the employee to address any other matters or concerns that they may have because obviously that's a difficult time for any employee to deal with. There aren't any prescribed timescales within which consultation should take place, but generally speaking, the shorter the consultation, the more likely is it is that its quality may be called into question. So if you pull somebody into a meeting in the afternoon and dismiss them half an hour later, it's more likely to be found to be unfair than if you uh, have a few days in between and you've got time to reflect on what's happened. That's mainly because if you do it in a short period, then there's more of an argument to say that there's no real consultation process, but in fact, um, it's a decision that's already been made. When you're consulting, the employee has the right to be accompanied by a companion of their choice, so a fellow employee or a union rep. And make sure when you're going through the individual consultation process that you also include absent employees in the process. So that's those on long-term sick leave or maternity leave. Looking at the selection, uh, the selection pool, Fair selection involves the fair application of objective selection criteria to a pool of employees. An employer should begin by identifying the pool, the group of employees from which it will select those who are to be made redundant. It's probably a term which you're um, familiar with. Before selecting an employee or employees for dismissal on grounds of redundancy, an employer must consider what the appropriate pool of employees for redundancy selection should be. Otherwise, the dismissal is likely to be unfair. Where the employer recognises a union, as we've already said, it will usually be expected to discuss the choice of the pool with the union. There aren't any fixed rules about how the pool should be defined, but the pool must be within the range of reasonable responses. So provided an employer genuinely applies its mind to the choice of a pool, it will be difficult for an employee or a tribunal to challenge its choice of pool. Um, having said that, it's not impossible, um, but there's, there's, a, there's a wide discretion there. Usually, an employer will want to keep the pool for selection fairly narrow. Employees, on the other hand, may want to argue that the pool should be wider, as that will usually lower the risk of them being selected. It can be fair to place employees in a pool of one, depending on the circumstances. For example, if there's only one employee or there's only one employee carrying out that particular role. But do be careful, because if you're choosing a pool that's the same size as the number of redundancies to be made, such a decision will be scrutinized carefully by the tribunal. You need to think in terms of roles, not people, to be dismissed. I set out there on the slide some relevant factors in identifying a pool. They're likely to be what type of work is ceasing or diminishing, the extent to which employees are doing similar work, possibly even including those at other locations if it's a multi-site organization the extent to which the employee's jobs are interchangeable, and whether the selection pool was agreed with the union or employee representative. In order to um, be reasonable, the redundancy selection criteria should, as far as possible, be both objective and capable of independent verification. So this means that the criteria should be measurable rather than just being based on someone's personal opinion. You can't get rid of them because you don't like them compared with somebody else. They should also be discussed with the union if one is recognized at the start of the exercise. So potentially fair criteria could include performance and ability, length of service, attendance records or disciplinary records. It is legitimate to attach weightings to the criteria reflecting their relative importance, but if you do that, then the employee needs to be able to justify those weightings. Where possible, criteria should be measured by reference to HR records covering such things as performance and attendance. So if you know that uh, a redundancy situation is likely, do try and make sure that you've got your records in place. Um, one last thing which I've, I've mentioned on the slide, and I mention this because it's one of the first things people tend to ask about when uh, dealing with redundancy, and that's this concept of last in, first out. It used to be seen as a common and popular method of redundancy selection. However, if it's a blunt instrument, uh, and in recent decades, 
it, well, it's a blunt instrument. In recent decades, length of service has fallen from favor as a dominant criterion. There are a number of reasons for that. Um, it's more likely to be viewed as acceptable if it's used as part of a balanced set of criteria or as a tie break where all of the factors are equal. If you use it as a sole or dominant criterion, particularly after the Equality Act, it's likely to result in claims for unfair dismissal and indirect discrimination on grounds of both age and sex because the older the people, that, in fact, um, Andrea's question on this is bang on point. I thought you couldn't use length of service for age discrimination. You can use it as a tie break, but if it's a sole criterion, obviously the people who are older are more likely to have been there longer, uh, so there could be indirect discrimination. Equally, um, because of maternity leave, or uh, late introduction into careers because of children, um, women might be indirectly adversely affected because they don't have the same length of service. So don't jump into last in, first out, um, view with caution. If fair selection criteria are unfairly applied, then the dismissal will still be unfair. Unfairness is likely to arise where there's a glaring inconsistency in the application of the criteria either as a result of bad faith or incompetence. In those cases, whilst a tribunal shouldn't attempt to remark employees, it is likely to get involved in the detail of how the scores were arrived at, typically through thorough questioning of the witnesses who mark the employees. So this is a heads up. An employer should be confident that if necessary, it can justify the application of the criteria. The employer should disclose the individual scores to the employee explaining how they were arrived at and give the employee a chance to challenge his individual markings as part of individual consultation. Bumping. Um, this is uh, another redundancy specific term. Bumping is the process of leaving a potentially redundant employee who we'll call A into another role and then dismissing the employee currently performing that role who we'll call B. It's still a redundancy dismissal, even if there's no actual or anticipated diminution in the requirements for employees to do B's work. But here it will be B, not A, who's being made redundant. There's no general obligation on an employer to consider bumping, but in some circumstances it may be unreasonable not to do so. Whether it's unfair to dismiss for redundancy without considering bumping is a matter of fact for the tribunal. Usually where it does take place, employees are bumped down. So that is senior employees are moved into lower ranking employees roles and then the lower ranking employees are dismissed. Alternative employment. Um, a dismissal is likely to be unfair if at the time of the dismissal the employer gave no consideration as to whether suitable alternative employment existed within its organisation. The duty on the employer is not to make every possible effort to look for alternative employment but to make reasonable efforts. Uh, an employer won't necessarily be expected to look throughout the whole group for vacancies if you're in a group of companies. A lot depends, and I keep saying this, on what's reasonable in the circumstances. In companies where information about group vacancies is regularly shared and there's some permeability between HR functions, it's likely that the employer will be expected to facilitate the employee's search for alternative vacancies or at the very least to draw his attention to them. Uh, there's no obligation to create alternative employment, however, where none already exists. Where an employer is dealing with more than one potentially redundant employee, it should ensure that all potentially redundant employees are made of it, aware of any vacancies and consider how it will choose which employees to make any offer of alternative employment to. Now, this process doesn't need to be as rigorous as the redundancy selection process, and at this stage, the employee is entitled to undertake a competitive interview process and also to appoint the candidate it considers to be best for the job, even if that's based on the subjective view. It simply needs to act fairly and reasonably in all the circumstances. One thing I haven't mentioned on the slide here when it comes to alternative employment is that once an employee has been selected for dismissal by reason of redundancy, they're entitled by statute to have a reasonable amount of, of time off work in order to go and try and find alternative employment. Uh, alternative employment, be that through the job center or other, um, other interviews. Now, there's no definition of what is reasonable, um, but it's going to depend on the circumstances. And just have that in mind if anybody asks you for some time off in that kind of a situation. Now, finally, uh, and 
uh, albeit not briefly, <laughs> some practical tips which I thought you might find useful uh, because the redundancy always comes about when there is some difficulty in the business or some difficult decisions to be made and people panic about the process which they need to go through. So I thought it would be helpful to take you through sort of a, a flow chart of what you ought to be doing and what might be regarded as best practice. I can't say it's going to apply to everybody. I can't say um, that you won't need to be doing more or less in the circumstances. Uh, but generally speaking, if you follow this procedure, you'll be doing more or less the right thing, mm -hmm. and you're likely to have the appropriate defense to an unfair dismissal claim. Um, a dismissal is likely to be unfair. Uh, sorry, I'm on the wrong bit. Have an in we, we've got a bit of interference here. Can you bear with me while we mute the, uh, mute the attendees? Hi guys, sorry about that. We're back now. That's better. I was just getting a bit distracted, but I could hear I could hear somebody having a chat over their lunch. Um, yeah. So these practical tips. First of all, have an initial meeting with all the potentially redundant employees to explain the reasons for the potential redundancies, and that although the employer has looked at alternatives, there don't appear to be any viable alternatives to redundancy at the current time. The employer should explain to the employees how many jobs are at risk of being redundant and the reasons for it. Redundancy should be presented as a possibility only at this stage to avoid any claim that the decision has already been made. The potentially redundant employees should be asked to consider ways of avoiding redundancy and let the employer know any suggestions that they have in that regard. Uh, the employer should also explain the selection criteria it intends to use for selecting the redundant employees if relevant and ask for any comments on the criteria that the employer plans to use. The content of the meeting should really be confirmed in writing to each potentially redundant employee at that stage. After that initial meeting with relevant employees, the employee will need to mark each of the potentially redundant employees according to the selection criteria discussed. It's best if two managers agree the scores for each individual to help ensure that the marks are objective, and that goes back to what I've said about there being close scrutiny of the marking process. Once the markers have established the employees with the lowest scores, the employer should write to each of the potentially redundant employees informing them of their provisional selection for redundancy and inviting them to a consultation meeting. The letter should be reasonably detailed and should set out the reasons for the redundancy and the individual scores and how they were arrived at. At the meeting, the employer should consult with the potentially redundant employee about their scores the proposal to select them for redundancy, and the terms of the redundancy. Their response, particularly in relation to their scores, should be considered and discussed at the meeting, and the employee should also consider whether there are any other roles that could be offered to them. Once you've had that uh, consultation meeting, the employer should follow up on any suggestions that the employee, employee has made to avoid their redundancy, and consider any representations that they've made in relation to the scores. If, on further consideration, the employer decides to increase the employee's scores, it will then need to check the scores of the other employees in the pool to see if that employee in question still falls below the cutoff point for redundancy selection. Provided that each potentially redundant employee is still the employee with the lowest score, the employee will need to write to the employee and invite them to a further consultation meeting. At this meeting, assuming that nothing has changed following the previous one, then the employer should confirm to the employee that they have been selected for redundancy. The employer should then go through the redundancy package with them, which should include any enhanced redundancy payment if appropriate in the, uh, under their employment contract, and inform them of their right to appeal against the decision. Again, the employer should make a detailed note of this meeting. Um, always, always uh, keep notes of meetings just in case it comes up for further scrutiny. After the meeting, the employee should write to each of the redundant um, employees concerned, setting out the decision to make them redundant and notifying them again of their right to appeal the decision. The letter should confirm whether the employee will be working out their notice or spending it on garden leave or receiving a payment in lieu. It should also set out in writing the calculation of their redundancy pay, and that's a statutory payment uh, which you uh, will be able to find guidance on online if you don't already have it. Um, if the employer has a, p a policy in relation to appeals, the employer should make sure that this procedure is followed. 
It's usual to set a period of time within which the employee must make their appeal, for example, within five days. If possible, the appeal should be to a higher level of management than the original decision maker. If the employee does appeal, then of course the employer should invite them to an appeal meeting. Um, a couple of final factors which I haven't popped on the practical tips slide there is that obviously redundancy is an uncertain time for employees. It's helpful if the employee can arrange for someone to be available throughout the consultation period to answer any queries raised by employees as and when they arise. On a larger scale redundancy exercise, consider producing maybe a question and answer sheet uh, for employees to assist their cons uh, the consultation process. Also, explain to employees that they have a right uh, to time off to look for alternative work, which you've already mentioned, and consider speaking to the local job centre and offering assistance with their CVs. Uh, a lot of employers in this kind of a situation will run a CV clinic or something like that. Um, so that they're helping with this alternative employment point. Um, but of course, the final tip is, if you've got any doubts, then ask. Uh, and uh, on the next slide, <laughs> on that note, you can find some my contact details. So do feel free. Um, if you find yourself in this situation and you need a steer, do feel free to get in touch. Uh, and I'd be more than happy to have a chat about it. Now, I appreciate I've bombarded you with a fair bit of information there, um, but now's the time, if anybody's got any questions about uh, redundancy and the unfair dismissal process, do feel free uh, to type in the chat box and I will do my best to assist you. All quiet. I think that's an absolute first. On all the other ones, we've had loads of questions. <laughs> Um, I appreciate redundancy, though. It's it's not something that you come across on a day-to-day -day basis like you might do a misconduct or a capability dismissal. Um, but, uh, you know, y you may have come across and you may have not. Uh, hopefully, this will all be relevant information in your arsenal going forward. We had a couple of typists then, but you've all disappeared off. <laughs> oh, here we go. What are the main reasons for successful employment tribunal claims when dealing with redundancy? The... Uh, main reasons for successful tribunal claims, it's really fact specific, but generally speaking, it's going to, be, it's going to come down to an unfair process. Usually unfair uh, pool selection, unfair application of um, criteria. Like I've already said, it's really difficult for anybody to challenge whether there's actually a redundancy situation because business decisions aren't something that the tribunal is going to determine. So once the decision has been made that there are going to be some changes in the business, make sure you follow a proper procedure. If you follow the proper procedure, you should be fine. Um, can I explain bumping again in relation to voluntary redundancy? Uh, um, we, I've been told by Liz that there's an article that can be... Oh, sorry, have I got an article? Yes, yes. Liz is, is mouthing <laughs> things at me over the table. Um, I can probably... Um, assist you with that, Joe, if we uh, chat afterwards. Uh, but generally speaking, voluntary redundancy is no different from compulsory redundancy. And um, it all comes down to whether or not they're being dismissed. And if somebody volunteers for dismissal, uh, volunteers for redundancy, they're volunteering to be dismissed. They're not volunteering to resign. So uh, if they want to step away and create uh, create a role, then I don't see any reason why they can't be, their shoes can't be filled. Um, but perhaps I've, I've got the wrong end of the stick of, of where you're coming from on that. So I'd be more than happy to chat about that with you if you want to drop me an email. Have we got anybody else who's got any? Uh, oh, here we go. Joe's back. If volunteers uh, allow a job for high grade. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yep, yeah, great. Um, has anybody else got any queries or any um any questions that have arisen out of what we've been chatting? I appreciate we're getting a bit close to uh, the time. Um, well, if anybody has got any, do feel free to drop me an email. I'd be more than happy to have a word with you. And uh, I'm going to pass you back over to the lovely Liz. 
Thank you, Helen. It's brilliant. There's lots of, lots of useful information there. Um, Helen also mentioned a couple of um, articles that we've been able to find online. So I'm just going to just go back over the slides and just make sure that I've got those references that maybe we can send to you on that email as well. So thank you very much, Helen. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. And thanks for all the questions that are coming through. And um, some information there with regards where you can find the slides, where you can connect with us, um, any sort of information that you might need. And as a final note, just to let you know, Helen will be back to talk about QP in the non-too-distant future. We're just going to firm up a date this afternoon and let you all know when that will be. In the meantime, next week, we've got Barbara Nixon talking about managing change. That's proving to be an exceptionally popular webinar. So if you're interested in that um, and you're registered, then please do log in early for it. And the week after Easter, we've got Michael Millward coming back to talk about workplace democracy. And I think that's going to start the spin-off, really, with regards to a whole sort of cultural um, cultural month, shall we say, with workplace culture, um, etc. So keep an eye pinned for that. So in, all I can do in the meantime is thank you all for coming today, and great to see so many faces on today's event, and look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you very much.